The Pittsburgh Steelers have been projected by Vegas's betting odds to actually have a losing record. But was Vegas right to do so? And can the Steelers beat that trend? We'll talk about that and answer questions about the Steelers draft picks under Omar Khan here in the Locked On Steelers podcast. Chris Carter joined by Nick Farabaugh today. It's going to be a fun one. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, bringing you your daily dose of all things in the Pittsburgh Steelers. As always, you can find the shapes of the show on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoy it. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of your daily Monday through Friday episodes, as well as our bonus content. Thank you for making us your first listen every day because we're your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Today, uh, game, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms and conditions apply. As I said before, we're joined by the man himself, Nick Farrabaugh. He's back on the show, but not in his former capacity. If you've been following the young man and his exploits, he does have a new place that he works. Nick Farrabaugh is your new Steelers beat writer for PennLive.com. Congratulations, Nick, on the new position with a great organization. Uh, we loved your work at Steelers now. We continue to appreciate them with Alan Saunders, but it's always great to see people make a move how you been nick i've been great man i've been great new place it's great over there at penline make sure to check stuff out over there by the way uh, i'm gonna plug it um you know it's my new my new place i'm, I'm starting there strong man I, it's been great and, and i've been taking this time you know between mini camp and, and training camp i went on vacation there you I go a little bit got a new job man we're chilling we're chilling right now that's winning at life, sir, and you deserve to do so because you've been kicking butt in your job uh, for for such a for such a long time. I appreciate you, Nick. Well, let's get into some 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 topics here. Uh, um, now, now that you're here, by the way, do check out PenLive.com for all the new work that Nick has. He's got a lot of stuff going on there, and he's just getting started. And y'all, if you've seen him, listened to him on this show. You know how good Nick is, so trust, tr trust, and believe that's going to be great, and he, we're, we're going to enjoy having him on this show uh, as we continue. But let's get into things here. I wanted to touch on some different topics, and as usual, we have our Locked On Steelers call in line, which, by the way, you can call in at any time. Call in at four one two 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 three six six four four. Leave your name, keep where you're from, and keep your question under a minute. We'll try to get your your question on the show. Nick, I wanted to tap into this caller because. You know, it's, it's around that time of the year where we're just kind of going over things, you know, during that quiet time before training camp. And sometimes we look at Las Vegas for the for the betting odds and the overall wins is something to kind of look at here. Oh, and here's Mikey from Cleveland who feel dismayed and maybe that the Steelers were disrespected by Las Vegas. Here's Mikey. Mikey from Cleveland, Ohio. So I'm calling right from enemy territory, but uh, I'm been in whole life. So. Gold. But my question today is. Um, looking at the for you know like the Vegas odds because a lot of people say they know more about because they're the Vegas odds. So my question is, why are we win team nine wins last year? Like you said on the previous show, our position rooms are better except for maybe our wide receiver rooms, either better or the same. Question is be why would they on us like that money i mean it seems like a joke i hear you i hear you mikey thank you for your question as always you can call 412-223-6644 to get your question on the locked on steelers podcast uh nick so just to review and because there was some choppy moments there with mike mike's audio but mike's point you know mike's point is like hey why do they keep doing this? Why do they keep projecting the Steelers to finish less than what, you know, a lot of people feel? And, and as it stands right now, Vegas has the Steelers at eight and a half wins is the over under mark and they're favoring the under. So it, basically the bet is right now that the Steelers are favored to finish with a losing record uh, this season. And it's it should be noted that last year it was a similar uh, odds as well there when you looked at it and the Steelers beat that. And in fact, Alan Saunders, our good buddy at SteelersNow.com, pointed this out in a recent article saying the Steelers have now beaten Vegas's projections four years in a row now for their win totals. Nick, do you feel like the odds making here 
does it make sense? Is it fair? Or is this maybe more of a national view that doesn't have a closer eye on what the Steelers have done with their team? Or are there other factors here? It's that way because it looks like they have the fourth best roster in the North. I think right. that's what it is. Top to, top down. Um, doesn't mean the roster is bad. It's not a bad roster. It's just look at the Bengals. Look at the Browns. Look at the Ravens. Those rosters are loaded, man. We, we talk about this division. It is the what I consider to be the hardest division in football. And don't forget, these odds are coming out on the heels of that schedule, man. The v Vegas legitimately has like bumped them down like a half a win after their schedule got revealed. Like Vegas does think that that schedule is a really hard schedule. I think it's a harder schedule than last year. Not not just how it's structured. I just think the teams they're going to play this year are better than the, some of the teams uh, they had last year, uh, just on a pay per view. But yeah, man, they got better. Uh, better quarterback room. In my opinion, I think the O-line is going to be better this year. Um, I think they're going to be better in secondary, and I think that's going to be big. They'll be better at linebacker. Um, so they got better across the roster outside of – even, the, you know, Mikey said this wide receiver. That still remains the big question. No true Deontay Johnson one-for-one -one replacement. Um, but but I look at the team, man. It's a talented team. It's, be, it's I think, top down from, you know, one through 53. I think it's a better roster than it was last mm -hmm. year. Not only that, I think the coaching staff is better. I think Arthur Smith is a clear upgrade on Matt Canada. And I think Great. his assistant, you know, some of the guys that he brought along with him, like Tom Arth um, and Zach Azani, uh, those are going to be guys that can implant some new DNA to that coaching staff. So I think it's a better offensive coaching staff. So they've gotten better. I also just think that they happen to play in the best division in football. And that's why you have this line. Do I agree with it? No, I think they're going to go over it again. I think they're going to win more than that. Uh, some, there's different lines. Some of them have a seven and a half, some of them have eight, eight and a half. Right. I think they'll go over that regardless. Uh, because I listen, man, look at what they did. Ten wins last year with mm -hmm. the quarterback play, with the offensive coordinating, uh, with some of the injuries they dealt with, you know, losing Minka for those long stretches. Cam Hader was out for half the year. Um, it was it was tough with those injuries. So I, I understand why Vegas has skepticism on it, um, just because of the schedule, you know. The guys that they brought in at quarterback have questions. Like Russell Wilson and Justin Fields have their questions. Um, but they're upgrades, in my opinion, compared to what they had last year. So I, I think they'll go over it again. I really do. Um, I understand why Vegas is doing it. I think it's a trap line, though, to go under. <laughs> I really do. I think it's a trap line. You're you're doubting Mike Tomlin like that to, to not go over that? I don't know. I think it's a trap line, man. I feel you on that. And I'm in the same way. I think the Steelers will be over this mark uh, just so it's to play. I, I want an interesting posit here because I think there's a there's always the the note of like, hey, this, yes, the AFC North is tough, but guess guess what the Steelers do well in? The AFC North. They 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 were five and one last year. Granted, no Joe Burrow, uh, but they they did very well last year. They traditionally handle the Ravens very well. Um, and even when Joe Burrow's played, they've gone back and forth with him. Uh so I think that there's and and the Browns, you know, it depends on on how on I think how you know, the Steelers' offense plays. If they play subpar, it's a it's 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 a battle. Uh, it's close. If the Steelers' offense plays well, the Brown they, the Browns usually don't hang with them. It's just been that long since the Steelers' offense has played well. Um, so uh, let's do this. Let's throw the AFC North out out of out of the picture here. Let's compare non divisional opponents this year versus last year in comparing the schedule. So last year. You had the the Niners, the Raiders, the Texans. And let's look at them as we know that they turned out to be, yeah. not what we thought they were going in the preseason. The Niners, the Raiders, the Texans, the Rams, the Jaguars, the Titans, the Packers, the Cardinals, the Patriots, the Colts, and the Seahawks. So that smattering of teams versus this year's teams, the Falcons, the Broncos, the Chargers, the Colts, the Cowboys, the Raiders, the Giants, the Commanders, the Eagles, and the Chiefs. I feel like there's some of those teams that can kind of cancel each other out there, like Chiefs, Niners, yeah. they've been to the Super Bowl. They've both been to the Super Bowl multiple times in recent years. I feel like that's one for one there. I feel like the Texans and the Eagles are kind of in similar spots, you know, with with where with where with where they are. They're they're they're, they're different in their strengths, but they're both young, you know, teams that, that that are that are in that playoff mix right there. But the rest of these teams, I do think it's interesting to look at and see which of these teams. Which, which which slate do you feel is more difficult? Taking the division out of consideration is this year's schedule without the division guys. You know, also is that is is that more tough than last year? 
it's interesting because um, right last year when you looked at that schedule, you didn't think the Texans were good, and obviously they ended up being a very good team. Even when the Packers came to town, remember everyone mm-hmm. thought that was a bad Packers team. Well, they ended up surging they- the divisional round. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it ended up being a really it, the Rams too. No one really thought the Rams were going to be that good. Um, honestly, like hey, there was a question about that those teams. Those teams end up being pretty good. I think we could see a similar thing happen this year. I think the Falcons are a much better team than they were a year ago. Just you know, Kirk Cousins adding more into that room. Um, Chargers, the Colts, the Colts with Anthony Richardson back mm-hmm. are a really fun team. Um, the Chargers, if they can ever get things on track, they have talent. I mean, they yeah. do. Um, if they ever right get on track, that's my whole thing. They should be better now that Brandon Staley right. is not there. <laughs> Right, they should be. So I think there are some teams that you can like look from last year, this year that have natural upside. But there are other teams on there. Um, the Commanders, they're probably going to be a plucky young team. Um, that's just a lot of new man. You know, Jane Daniels and what we're going to have. It's they they could be plucky, but they're probably not going to be you know a great team. The year one there. The Raiders, they feel like they kind of – I like Antonio Pierce and I like the identity they established defensively, but let's be real, no one's scared by that offense. Um, look at the personnel that they have on that offense. Um, so, you know, there are some teams, man, that you look at and you say, uh, you know, like the Giants. I mean, they're the Giants. Uh, the yeah. Jets, I have no idea what to think of the Jets. Um, right. Like there's just some there, – there's a lot of questions. It could be tougher. I think, the, you know, when you go quarterback for quarterback – I, I think that's interesting too, mm-hmm. uh, because I don't think either is appreciably better. Um, I think you know you look at some of the quarterbacks they faced last year. Obviously, you have Mahomes on that, which yeah. is just which is a whole other you know, level, right? I, I do think you know the schedule. I do think the schedule layout itself does make it a little harder, just because you have all those six divisional games. The timing of it, yeah, right. I, and then and, and then and then you're like, okay, well, who are my off games? When the divisional games are there. Okay, first one after the bye weeks, the commanders. Fine. But the two weeks, Eagles, Chiefs. Whoa. <laughs> like that's right. And, and that's... you get the Chiefs on a short week, too, right? You mm-hmm. get the Chiefs on a short week. A uh, um, super but, short week. Right. Because it's Christmas. So I think, you know, that that does kind of raise some concerns about that. And so, you know, I, I don't think Vegas loves Russell Wilson or Justin Fields. I think that's something um, that has. It kind of been made clear through the signings. I don't think they're super high on them. Listen, I get it, but in my opinion, they're better than the quarterbacks they had last year, which is, is what matters when we're talking about this. It's a better roster top to bottom. And I said, you know, it looks like the fourth best roster in the AFC North. I think you can make an argument it's it's better than that. I do think you can make, you know, an argument um, against the Browns. Uh, I think you can make that argument. I think you can make that argument against the Bengals. I think they have a few, you know, holes you can look at. Um, but I really do think, you know, the Steelers closed the gap. Like, I think that's one thing. I think even if they are the fourth, last year it might have been like this much. Now I mm. think it's like that much. And so okay. I think they closed that gap even in the north. And you talked about their success in the north. Since 2020, they have the best record against the AC North. Um, mm-hmm. No one has a better record in the north. So really – I think you know they're going to go over that Vegas win. I, I I'm feeling ten wins right now. I think that makes sense. I do think the schedule is just more difficult from how it's laid out. I think I some of those teams early on have a chance to be much better too uh, than they were last year. Um, you know, with some the upside that they have. Um, but I, I I really you know if you're talking you know seven and ten, you know which is what it might have to be to go under in some of these you know whatever outlet you're using or eight and nine. I I don't think they're going to reach that. I think they're going to reach 10 7. That's my. I, I feel you on that. I want to talk about the Steelers front office next here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Chris Carter with Nick Farabaugh. Stick with us. We'll be right back. But first, I want to remind you this show is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the app you need to download right on your phone right now to buy tickets to all your favorite events without it being stressful because Game Time is where you can book the tickets to all your favorite sporting events and so much more. With it being summertime, it's baseball season. So get tickets to see your favorite ball club play with their next game on Game Time. Whether you're in Pittsburgh, you want to see Ricky Phenom Paul Skeens pitch on the mound for the Pirates, or you're in Los Angeles and you want to see Shohei Otani be a world sensation for the Dodgers, Game Time has got you wherever you go. You can either go, go download the app on your phone or go to their website, Game Time. 
Co. When you when you get there, you'll find out it's a fast and easy way to buy tickets to all your sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. That you can save up to sixty percent off tickets, buying tickets at the last minute for sports, concerts, and so many events. Plus, the game times best game times get best best price guarantee is the best out there because if you find tickets in the same section or row for less somewhere else, Game Time will credit you one hundred and ten percent of the difference of those prices. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your your, net, your first purchase, or go to their website Game Time. Co. Terms and conditions apply. Create an account. Redeem code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. We're back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host Chris Carter here with Nick Farabaugh of penlive.com Steelers beat reporter there all right Nick let's get into this next question here because it's gonna it's gonna open up a bunch of different thoughts here on on the Steelers recent drafts and specifically the 2023 draft but here's Sam from Indiana asking a question about that group hey Chris this is Sam from Indiana Pennsylvania I just had a fun little question if we were to redraft the last draft class where do you think they would go in the draft do you think Project Jones would go sooner or JPJ go sooner just curious so that, there is our question there from Sam. Thanks for calling in again, 412-223-6644 to get your qu- question on the show. Leave your name, where you're from, and keep your question under a minute. Nick, before I get into what other people said, I'd like to see, do you think, and let's stick to let's stick to the top three picks, Broderick Jones, Joey Porter Jr., Keanu Benton. Do you think those three picks, which of those three picks would be higher or lower from where they were selected in the 2023 draft? I think – for sure, Porter and Benton go earlier. That's, okay. that's something I see. Broderick feels like either slightly down or a push. I don't necessarily think he's he's guaranteed to go up. I don't think any of those O linemen. You look at the O linemen that went early. It was what Paris Johnson, mm-hmm. um, Darnell you know, Wright. Yeah, it was Darnell Wright uh, and Peter Skaronsky, and then Broderick Jones. I, I mean, those guys really haven't done a ton to differentiate themselves. Donna Wright might have had the best rookie season out of any, actually. Um, so maybe he goes up. But I don't appreciably think Broderick Jones, you know, goes down the board uh, considerably if he does it all. Um, Dewan Jones probably goes higher. He had a pretty good rookie year with the he did. Browns. Um, so he probably goes earlier uh, in that OT conversation. But, like, you know, Anton Harrison – was he appreciably better than Broderick Jones? No, not particularly. Um, so I, I think, you know, you have two going up and Broderick Jones is maybe down, you know, a few picks. Maybe the Steelers stick at 17 and take him, whatever. Um, but he's not going very far. I think it's much of a push there. I feel you on that. And, and to do a comparison real quick, I looked at some redrafts because that's an article thing that happens. We looked to the athletic. You had um, uh, Nick Baumgardner. Uh, earlier earlier this year do, do a redraft and he had uh, kind of like what you said he had Joey Porter Jr. and Keanu Benton uh, drafted higher uh, than than they actually were uh, trying to find where he put them again here but I did see this um, Joey Porter was the 25th pick overall to the new to the New York Giants and and Keanu Benton right went I went right after him to the Cowboys at 26th overall. So two second round picks bumped into the fir- first round, and I do think that that's interesting there. Uh, but Broderick Jones nowhere to be found in first round picks here. Now, in my estimation, if we were to like again redrafts are just kind of a fun topic, but the uh, if we were to to redo this based off of their first year performance, I, I I'm with you. I think that Broderick Jones, like if he falls to the Steelers, they're still taking him because I think the Steelers are like still like we got the guy there. I think that there's a lot of confidence in what he showed as a rookie. Um, it just may not have computed out to PFF grades or whatever, uh, but. Uh, but I certainly think that Keanu Benton and Joey Porter Jr. performed pretty well. And then also I went to CBS and similarly there, um, those guys, those two guys received received boosts uh, in their in their value. Saw Broderick Jones not listed as a first round pick there, but Benton in that one was listed as the tenth overall pick by the Eagles uh, there. So in, in, in on CBS, and then Joey Porter was listed as the thirtieth overall pick. So only a, a, only a slight bump but still up into the first round of what it was uh, for NFL.com's uh, from Chris uh, Trapasso uh, back earlier this year. And again, these are just the, the, the whole point of these is to look at these and, and ask yourself like, okay, how did everyone perform and knowing that, how is it, and how did this, you know, let's, how is this draft 
playing out so far because I think that's the whole point of this. It's like, you know, this exercise, it's it, you know, people are like, well, this is kind of pointless because it's not they can't be redrafted. Yes, but now we're we're evaluating how these draft picks at least look one year into the process. And I think that's the fun of it. To me, I agree with the notion that I think Porter's definitely a first round pick with the way that he played for the Steelers. People see that, you know, you look at guys like Christian Gonzalez, you know, I think that he might be considered there. Deontay Banks. I think that you put you you put him up a, a little bit higher in that conversation. I think Keanu Benton. I think Keanu Benton surprised a lot of people with how strong he was, and people saw like, oh man, when he puts it all together, he's going to be a problem. I think that he might. Uh, you saw in CBS, he was tenth overall in that redraft. I don't know if he'd go that high, but I do think his stock would be significant. Like the Steelers would not be able to get him this the next time around. 100 percent Keanu Benton to me uh dude has the high ceiling of the class I really think mm. that I mean he he when I, when I saw him last year in the senior bowl um that was before you know I kind of found out the senior bowl that they liked him because they've met with him like 10 times or something it was ridiculous um but he's built like the Hulk dude like I think I told you that at training camp I said mm-hmm. this guy's built like the perfect put together defensive line I mean, he's got these broad shoulders. He's super explosive off the line. He's strong with his hands and, you know, his lower body and his strength. Uh, So it's hard to move him, man. Like, his core strength is very, very good. And he plays low because he has that wrestling background. Um, So you look at Keanu Benton, and it all he needs to do is finish. Like, there were – what did Carl Dunbar say? Seven sacks that they think he missed? Yeah, seven. Um, it, it, I mean, he, dude, he was all over the quarterbacks last year. I mean, he's a really good run defender. Does he have some, you know, young guy things to clean up? Sure. Absolutely. I, th- I think he needs to tighten the corner a little bit. Um, I think he just needs to tackle better strictly. I think that's something he just needs to do better. Um, but he is a phenomenal player. I, I am very high on Keanu Benton. I think Joey Porter Jr. I, I get last year was a loaded corner group. But yeah. what he did against number one guys, I think I'd probably have him going a little earlier. I think Gonzalez, you know, you could put higher, but the man missed almost his entire rookie season um, right. with injury. So, um, and I love Christian Gonzalez coming out, and I Same. think uh, um, Devin Witherspoon probably is still, you know, CB one. Um, and then you yeah, know, yeah, he's on a different yeah, he's on a different level yeah. And then Porter, man, I mean, he has to be in the convo. Uh, you know, Deontay Banks obviously has to be in there too, um, but he, he has to be in that discussion. Uh, like right after that. So I I think you look at this group and it makes sense for those two to go higher. I think with Broderick, I understand the draw. And the reason I say that is, and why it shouldn't alarm anybody is because he was always a guy that was going to need a little bit of work. He came out raw with his technique. So it shouldn't surprise you year one. He had some struggles. Offensive linemen very rarely come into the NFL and are fantastic. Now we've seen that in recent years, you know, guys like Rashawn Slater and, um, you know, Tristan Wirfs and, and these guys that are rookie superstars at tackle. It doesn't happen very often. Those guys that do that are really special. And Roderick Jones obviously had himself some slip ups and pass pro, but his run, dude, his run blocking electric. And I think he, he's improving on the pass pro stuff. So I'm not surprised that, you know, he's dropping a little bit in those mocks. It kind of makes sense after a year. If you're a raw player that gets a little bit of playing time, you're probably going to show some of those flaws on film. But I don't think that's any indictment on Roderick Jones. Same here. I think that Broderick Jones, we all knew how raw he was, but we also knew how his raw strength. And that's the thing that, that you're going to grow there. And, and kind of to the point here, offensive and defensive linemen are often the, the, got the groups that take a little bit longer to develop, especially when their thing is their size and their strength. It took years for cam hayward to become cam hayward uh, you know and to become that just that stalwart guy stefan too was on the cusp of that when he ended up retiring and i think that that's something that takes time but uh, even so like you said the steelers offense again i will i will keep yelling this until uh we we see more we see more or less progress in 2024 but the steelers offense went from being a middle of the road to sub average run team to having the second best rushing offense in the second half of the season. And one move coincided with that, particularly with Broderick Jones going to right tackle. And it's not saying that he did it by himself, but he was part of that change. And I think that a growing Broderick Jones, one that's learned and one who we've talked to Nick, and I think he's demonstrated he's not taking a first year for granted. He's not just saying, oh, I'm the first round pick. I'm fine. He's working to get better. I want to talk more about that 
and the Steelers front office and how we see that moving forward with their early moves, how that in, uh, how that sets up what they could look like in the coming years. That's more here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Chris Carter, Nick Farabaugh, stick with us. We'll be right back. We're back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Chris Carter, Nick Farabaugh. Nick, let's dive back in here. Finishing up on Broderick Jones. Um, I, I I do think that, yes, there's there's things you look at there. And if you're basing it just off his first year play, yeah, he probably falls down in, in the in the rankings a bit just because of you know other playmakers getting a chance to be there. But to me, Nick, I still look at, at Broderick Jones and I think that he could end, still end up being the best tackle of his class. And to your point, you know, and, and this is, going to about, you know, talking about the value of Benton and guys, these were all guys that I think you and I talk. I remember us talking about this leading into that draft and then coming out of it. They, all, I said, all the Steelers top four picks, including Darnell Washington, were in my top 40 players. And especially Benton, Porter and Jones were all in like my top, like 25 ish. So like for me, I'm like, yeah, if I was to see a redraft, like if I was to do this all over again, I would, uh, the Steelers would not be able to get all three of those guys. They might be lucky to get one of them. And, and that's where I see it. But I, I look at this and it makes me think about if they were able to get this. And again, it's just one year. We got to still got to see these guys develop. How does this happen over time? What does this 2024 class look like? What does the next year's class look like? How do guys, you know, mold themselves together with this team and what other moves do they make? But this, is this enough of a sign of encouragement to make you think like, hey, all these preconceived notions about what the Steelers front office is like, Let's give this group a chance to grow, and maybe they're even better than what the Colbert era was doing in the, in the five years leading up to you know the start of Omar Khan's leadership. Well, it's a different. There's definitely a different philosophy. Uh, yes, I think there's no question about that. For one, while I think Omar is patient, I know this is how he describes. It. He says he's not aggressive. He's just patient. I think he is. I think you can combine that. He's patiently aggressive. That's how I would call him. Like he he scans the world of the NFL and he has a great pulse on what's gonna happen. I think the Justin Fields move, man, is like a big part of that. Like, okay, Kenny Pickett was the plan, you know, to be the guy with Russell Wilson, to have that little summer competition. And he suddenly, you know, he wants to get traded. They trade him and they get Justin Fields for a conditional six. Like, remember what how people were throwing around these trade figures for Justin Fields, mm -hmm. maybe a first rounder, high second yeah. rounder. Mm -hmm. No, no, like they didn't end up like that. Um, so I think Omar Khan has a great pulse on, you know, what's going to happen. I think that's partially because of his work with agents um, over the years as a capologist. I think he has such a deep button on what you're going to do in the, in the agent world. And those connections do help him. Like they really do help him kind of, figure things out across the league. Um, so I think that's one thing that's different because Kevin Colbert comes from a scouting background and you just, you think a little differently about football when you come from that versus say a cap background, like Omar Khan. Uh, I think they focus on positional value. I think that's another thing that's kind of become pretty clear. I think either it's positional value or premium players at non-premium positions. And what I mean by non-premium, you know, premium players at non-premium positions Look at uh, free safety, Minka Fitzpatrick. They extend him very early in the in the con era. Uh, they go out and sign Patrick Queen. That's a premium player at a non-premium position. Um, so if you are, if they're going to pay you big money and they're going to go out and make this big investment in you at a non-premium spot, you're going to be a superstar. That's what that's what they're saying. But otherwise, they draft tackle, they draft you know receiver, they draft these big kind of big value name uh, positions and they do that a lot. And so I think, you know, there's a little bit more of an analytical approach to things too. Um, I, I think, you know, Omar Khan definitely has a background in the analytics side of things. So that's, yes. that's kind of melted into, you know, the scouting that Andy Weidel has. I, I think that's a really big part of it too. I think Omar Khan has surrounded himself with people he trusts that are from deep scouting backgrounds. You talk about the Andy Wiles, the Sheldon Whites, um, this whole new scouting team that he's just created because the turnover, Chris, you and I have seen this ourselves when we're inside that building. The turnover in the scouting staff, mm -hmm. immense from when yes. the was there, it's pretty much all new. I mean, there's a few guys that are left over. 
but it is almost all new. And so it's different philosophically than what we saw. And so a lot of moves that would have been out of character for a Colbert regime aren't anymore. And, and that's, that's kind of interesting, man. And they maximize value so well. I think in the draft, we talk about that. Like, look at the value they got in 23, knowing when poor, you know, poor, I don't know if they necessarily knew Porter was going to fall to them at 32, but the fact that he did, I mean, they nab him, right? They didn't overthink it. They didn't get out of 32 and trade out of there. Go get it. Um, this year, I thought they did. They understood, um, even, you know, if Omar Khan was calling about trade ups for Troy Fa Utanu, um, you know, didn't, didn't kind of panic on that, even mm-hmm. if. Even if he told us how much he was panicking inside, you know, the, I think there's something to be said about the restraint you have to have um, in that. And he, they get him at 20. Frazier falls to them. Like, dude, Falutano and Frazier is great value. Roman Wilson, who some thought they would take in round two, falls to them in round three. Peyton Wilson. Like, you can see them maximizing value up and down the board. Last year, Corey Trice falls. You mm-hmm. get him late. Um, Nick Herbig. I mean, we didn't even that's mention the other. Him. That's the other thing. I left Nick Herbig out intentionally because I wanted to come back to him because I also think he would be drafted significantly uh, higher. 100%. Dude, he was, he didn't get that much playing time last year uh, defensively. Mm-hmm. But what he did, he was a turnover machine. Everyone could notice him. Caused havoc. I mean, I, he could be really, really good this year. Know that he's going to have more of that as that outside linebacker three. But they maximize value in in most trades, and I think they do it a lot in contracts, the way contracts are structured. I think, you know, they have outs within their deals. Like you even look at that Patrick Queen deal, which is what, three for 41, I think, something like that. Um, and like they can get out of it early if they want to, or they can extend. Uh, there's flexibility. They have options. So they're not burning, you know, they're not turning into the New Orleans Saints, for example, where they're having all these void years and they're going to have to make these big time moves. Um, so, he's still drawing on that cat background and they're maximizing value across the board. So it's, it's, it's interesting to kind of see Omar Khan work. I think we'll ultimately see the results of that uh, bear out, but the process by which he goes about making these moves happen, it's pretty sound. I, I, I think, I think so too. And that's the thing about that. I wanted to touch on here at the front office future and tying into the whole redrafting conversation, because again, this is when you're talking about revaluing, you're talking about where do you value re, re you know, uh, redrafting. You're talking about where do you value guys now versus then? And I, I think that at the time I said like, Hey, all these guys are, are, I think are, are higher value than they were given this draft. And so far for the most part, I think I've been proven right about the 2023 and again, the 2020 draft class. And again, that's it's very early. I'm not saying that any of these things are sure fire. If you went back to after Devin Bush's first year, a lot of people thought, including myself, that he was about to be a problem in the NFL. And then he was a problem for the Steelers, uh, you know, after his injury. But, um, you know, again, again, I think that all this, all these signs point to at least in the early indication from what we have to evaluate of this front office. They understand value. They understand how to operate. And, they, and I think they have a, a great understanding, not just of what they value, but of what other teams value and how they're act on, act on it. And that's allowing them to go and get guys with that. Maybe normally you wouldn't, you don't think you'd be able to get, but because you understand where those spots are, you can make smarter plays. And that's something that could be very unique for the Steelers as they continue this rebuild to get back to being a Super Bowl contender in the coming years. And I think that we, I talked about those agent relationships that mm-hmm. Omar Khan has that are extremely strong from his years of being a cap guru. Again, that's he understands and kind of hears the talk of where's this guy going in the draft or what's this guy going to fetch on the market. And, and like that's unique. There's not many capologists that turn into GMs and have this kind of uh, feel over the league. And so when you make see him making these maximizing value moves, I think you have to understand that background comes with its unique set of advantages. And I think part of what Omar Khan is doing is he's not trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, a lot of what he does is logical. Um, a lot of what he does is maximizing opportunity. Um, he doesn't have huge margin for errors. Like a lot of these moves, like signing Patrick Queen is a floor raising move as much as it is a ceiling raising move. Right. If a, I think another thing is if you have an opportunity that comes along that has upside to it and otherwise you would be stuck in the mud like this year the Steelers were in a really hard spot at quarterback really regardless of what they did outside of you know 
if they really wanted to shell out that money for Kirk Cousins. That would have been like the only massive swing they could have made this year at quarterback. So what did they do? They took Russell Wilson on the veteran minimum, and then they basically took a lottery ticket, two lottery tickets really, by signing Russell Wilson for the veteran minimum and trading for Justin Fields. Doesn't mean it's going to work out results-wise, but this year was always going to be a really hard year for them, a quarterback, because it was either going to be spent evaluating Kenny Pickett when maybe you already had thoughts about Kenny Pickett, or it was going to be kind of what they've done here, which is throwing something together and hoping it works. But they have two lottery tickets. And the process by which you go about that, where when you go into a year where it might be more of a transitional year, and Chris, I think this does feel like for them, it feels like a bit of a transitional year. Look at all the mm-hmm. contracts that are Absolutely. scheduled to uh, expire after this season. It feels like a bit of a transitional year for them. When you go into a year like this, you need upside on the team that could maybe be something for you after this year. And I think they did that at quarterback. Like That's just good process. I think that's something to note. When you go about the good process as a GM, usually the results will follow as long as you know what you're doing on that side of things. Um, So I think Omar Khan is executing good process throughout his GMing. And more importantly, I think he's surrounding himself with guys, you know, that are strong scouts from that background. So you're kind of filling in the weak points of his uh, general manager resume by bringing in a guy like Andy Weidel, for example. You hear that depth? You hear that analysis? All the thought? That's what you get when you talk to a Nick Farabaugh now of PennLive.com. Nick, thanks so much for joining us here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Let people know where they can find you, follow you, and get all of that work at your new place. Yeah, you can uh, You see that Farabaugh FB. You can follow me on my personal account. Uh, make sure to follow Steeler at PennLive uh, on X, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. We're going to have posts over there. And make sure to check out the YouTube channel because uh, I got a podcast coming. And Chris, hey. I'm sure, I'm sure hey. we'll have you over there. So hey, I'll be happy fun. to come on. Let's go, let's go, Nick. Thanks so much for joining us here. Follow all of his great work at Penn Live. I'm Chris Carter, your host of the Locked On Steelers podcast. Thank you for tuning in again. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Carter Critiques. You can work, you can read my work at the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Find me here on the Locked On Steelers podcast every day, Monday through Friday, breaking down your Pittsburgh Steelers. Back tomorrow, we got Mark Caboli joining the show want to get his thoughts on some things then we'll see you here on the locked on Steelers podcast